Welcome to Jen Rubin's Green Room. This is Jen Rubin. Last week, I had a wonderful conversation with my dear friend, Dahlia Lithwick. And one of the things we talked about, of course, was the Dobbs decision, which overturned 50 years of precedent, made a whole bunch of terrifying assumptions about women and about um, their access to medical care. And it got me thinking that we should really have an entire show devoted to that subject. And I thought there was no one better to talk to um, than Elise Hogue. Elise has been a progressive activist for decades. I got to know her when she was head of NARAL, and I interviewed her for my book. She was incredibly generous with her time uh, then, and uh, some of the most interesting conversations I had were about how she and her organization prepared for the inevitable, prepared for a Supreme Court that was going to strike down Roe at some point. The warnings that she has given for decades now about where the court was heading and really dealing with the aftermath of this decision that leaves women endangered without control over their own lives, their own reproduction. And these are important topics, scary topics, um, but there's no one better than Elise to talk us through that. So welcome to the show, Elise. So good to be here, Jennifer. It is. I first met Elise, as I mentioned, when I was working on my book, and I had to get all of the nitty gritty details of the court fights, the abortion decisions, the first abortion bans, which we saw before there were six members on the Supreme Court to actually make that, um, I hate to use the word constitutional, but temporarily constitutional. And Elise and I would have these conversations that went something like this. You know, Jennifer, I've been telling these people for decades that Roe is not secure, that the far right has a game plan, and I am just called nuts. I'm called a hysteric. I'm called you know, completely off my rocker. Well, Lise, you were not off your rocker. (laughs) And unfortunately, the horror has come to pass. So let's roll the clock back a bit, you know, to the dark ages when women had civil liberties and were continued um, to be first-class citizens. How did you grasp early on that the far right had this game plan and that we should have been taking their rhetoric seriously. What about what they were saying kind of tipped you off and made you tune in to hear, it wasn't even dog whistles, um, but that they had this big plan and we were whistling past the graveyard? Mm. I mean, I think that my first inkling that all was not what I thought it was when was long before I was actually considered myself a reproductive rights advocate in any way, although I was certainly pro-choice. Um, and I was working on passing Obamacare and the Stupak Amendment happened. And I don't know if your listeners will recall, but this was a um, amendment in the House that sort of explicitly banned federal funds through Obamacare to going to provide abortion services. Um, Aside from that, putting aside the fact that it was a completely unnecessary, redundant um, amendment because the Hyde Amendment at the time had already and and actually continues to ban federal funds from going to abortion, um, it really put a wrench in the gears of the entire healthcare conversation. And one of the things that was sort of most shocking to me about it was um, that the Democrats seemed to be caught flat-footed by the fight. And there was, I would say, a less than full-throated defense of abortion rights But also, they just seemed kind of um, surprised by the fact that the right was using this tool, um, maybe ideologically, but from where I sat, it certainly looked more like to stop the president from doing something that he very much wanted to do. So I started to go, hmm, there's more than meets the eye to what's going on here. And then once you see it, you kind of can't unsee it. All of a sudden, everywhere I would see, oh, anytime they want to block progress, they're just throwing abortion out there as a way to block progress. And then I'll never forget, in 2012, I was writing for The Nation, 
um, at that moment that uh, who was then a a little-known candidate in Missouri named Todd Aiken challenging Claire McCaskill um, for for uh, her her Senate seat um, and was winning, by the way. I think people forget that. He was actually winning um, when he said, uh, you know, you don't need abortion in the case of rape because if it's a legitimate rape, the body has a way of shutting the whole thing down. This became a national symbol of how extreme the right had become. And it was so apparent, by the way, that this guy was just speaking his truth. Like, he didn't even think he had said anything wrong. And so I wrote an article for The Nation, and in it I started to dig around. And I realized that despite the fact that the Republicans were kind of backpedaling as fast as they could from him and treating him like an outlier, there was already a bill introduced in the House that was co-signed by very many mainstream Republicans that actually had a definition of legitimate rape as it related to reproductive health care. So I became on a crusade to help people understand that this was a long-term strategy, that it was more mainstream in the Republican Party than people realized, and that unless we did something dramatically different, we were going to end up right where we are now. Right. Now, it seemed that at the time, this is when Roe was still in force, that Republicans had this very simple message, this life issue, that um, this was an innocent life, as if the woman didn't have an innocent life. And I think then... And maybe at least up through Dobbs, I think the abortion rights community had a hard time coming up with a message that they felt comfortable with, that they could articulate. Can you talk a little bit about the difficulty and kind of the aversion for many Democrats that they had to talking about abortion rights? Um, Well, (laughs) Jennifer, I would say having come to abortion rights and not from abortion rights, I would say that that sort of lack of coherent message on the part of the Democrats could be applied to so many issues. (laughs) Is that point taken? Point taken. However, I do think what you had was a particularly um, implicit problem with the older generation Democrats who were raised in an extraordinarily stigmatized environment. Um, And that was especially prevalent among leadership in the Democratic Party. It didn't mean that they voted wrong on the legislation, but it meant that when what was required was a battle waged on values, on basic principles, they were more like, let's just check the box, do as little as possible and move on because we're uncomfortable talking about this. I will say that there were many of us for quite some time that recognized that, well, abortion is health care, and if you can't get access to abortion, and certainly post-Dobbs, we're starting to hear far too many of these stories, it risks your life and health, that there was a higher order value at play, and that was what we were going to win or lose on, and that was one of freedom. And I think what we saw post-Dobbs and in 2022 was a sort of... um, aggregation around the idea that this really is symbolic and and materially, not just symbolically, about freedom. And I was really, really pleased to see so many Democrats running in 2022 embracing that message. And, and we will get to that. Let me back up just a little bit. And when the Dobbs opinion was leaked uh, and it was as bad as it was, were you surprised at that point? Did you think that the court was going to move more incrementally than it did? Um, I thought surprise would be a strong term. I thought there was a very, very good chance that the fundamentalists on the court were going to steamroll over Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts. And I don't think he wanted that. And I think it's pretty well documented that he was uncomfortable with their um, overreach. But I think that they inherently have always known what sort of broader society is grappling with, which is they're unpopular. Their position is unpopular. And they had this moment in time 
to establish the most fundamentalist version of what they wanted to see happen through pure fiat because they had the majority on the court. And if they didn't go for broke, it might not come again because the popular uprising was very, very palpable at that point, and they just wanted it done. That is very interesting. I don't think I've heard that analysis before. And it just shows you how partisan and political this court really is. Um, You know, put aside for a moment, although we really shouldn't, that this was 50 years of precedent, that the test for doing away with precedent wasn't even attempted, let alone met, that the court disregarded women's side of the equation, that the court made this ridiculous assertion that women can pursue their rights at the ballot box as if we allow the First Amendment or racial equality to be decided at the ballot box. Put all of that aside for just a moment. And you see that the argument for this decision is so weak, is so non-existent. It's simply because they have the votes, they want to do it, and they found six people who in their religious whatever value system, if you want to say, um, want to establish that a human being is a human being from the time of conception. Did we miss something? Was there any other logical rationale, um, legal principle? If you looked back for 50 years, there was literally nothing other than their dissents in all of these cases that would have prepared you for this, ah, We got the votes. Here we go. (laughs) I don't think we missed anything other than the fact that this was, as you say, a multi-decade campaign to put the pieces in place to be able to make such a draconian move. And by the way, I don't think they're done. And I think, you know, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that, but um, I I don't think they're done. Um, I think that, you know, from the establishment of the Federalist Society— There was a particularly authoritarian perspective on the worldview that these people wanted to see ruling the United States, and they saw the court as one of the most effective ways to implement that worldview. And intrinsic, by the way, everywhere around the world, wherever you see the rise of authoritarianism, you see reproductive oppression as part of it and rigid gender roles um, as part of it. This is so important. This is so important. And whether you look at Nazi Germany, we'll go there because that is one of the examples of history. Whether you look at Brazil, in an authoritarian system, they are always using religion and paternalism as a club Mm -hmm. to keep people in line and to keep women in line. And that is such an important part that authoritarians have to go there. There's no authoritarianism unless you control the family, unless you control children, unless you control women's uh, rights to make these decisions. So it's almost implicit. It's part of who they are. It's part and parcel. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not such a stretch, Jennifer, to actually compare it to Nazi Germany. One of the things that I wrote about in the book um, is that, going back to Todd Aiken, that idea of legitimate rape not leading to pregnancy actually was founded in an experiments on concentration camp prisoners in Auschwitz. It came out of the medical experiments on them being subjected to rape and then not getting pregnant. And then that traveled through the authoritarian sort of mindset over to the new world and became part of the lexicon of the far right dominionists. And I think it's really important that people understand that direct line and that history because it is inextricable. That sort of idea of white supremacy, authoritarianism, patriarchy, and reproductive oppression, you cannot tease them apart. Right. And as someone who's watched the rise of white Christian nationalism, the other kind of defining feature of this is their refusal to acknowledge that this is a religious 
sectarian position that is not grounded in science. They seem to simply assume that, oh, well, there's a fertilized egg. Of course, human life slash 14th Amendment rights of women go away, of course. That is an ideological position founded on what significance one gives to a fertilized egg. You could make that decision at quickening, which used to be a test um, that was you know, prevalent in some parts of the United States. You could make it at birth, but they refuse to even admit that what they're doing is theocratic rule. And it's it would be amusing if it weren't so horrifying. And I wonder if they're really oblivious or they're just pretending to be. Because what else is this other than a religious position? Yeah, I think that they are, I mean, depending on who that they in question are, are not oblivious. But I go back to the point that they have always known that they do not have popular opinion on their side. And so they have a couple of different tools in their toolbox. One we talked about, which is court capture, because if you can't win through elections, then you're going to have to do it through the judiciary. But the other was to confuse people. And so debating around the edges with propaganda and mis- and disinformation, I mean, just, you know, to your point about science, naming these abortion bans, heartbeat bills, when any medical doctor will testify that that is not, in fact, what is happening in a fetus at that point in time. But it puts the head at heart, at war with the heart. And they've known that and it confuses people. And there are, you know, people are like, I'm not an expert. So do I know if there's a heartbeat? I don't know if there's a heartbeat. This person says there is. This person says there isn't. And I think they thrive on that confusion because confusion leads to disengagement. And that helps if you don't have the people on your side. That is so so true. And you get these ongoing tropes, you know, you're for abortion, the, you know, up to the moment of birth. There is no state in the country that takes that position. And if there were such a position, it would only be dictated because the mother was in extreme danger. But it doesn't stop them from saying it. Let's now talk about uh, Dobbs. Dobbs comes down, even though I was fully prepared for it because I knew what the court was up to, I had seen the leak, it still struck me like a gut punch. It still, it didn't surprise me, but it was so horrifying to me as I realized that we were going back 50 years that women were being denied control of their bodies. I'm curious whether you had that same emotional reaction, even though you knew it was coming, even though you had seen the draft opinion, did you have that moment of, oh my gosh, it's actually happened? Oh, I was an emotional basket case. In fact, I'm not sure I wasn't having a panic attack. I was on a plane landing in Richmond, Virginia. I'd actually been diverted to Richmond. I wasn't even trying to go to Richmond. And as soon as the plane got low enough for my phone to have reception, it started going nuts. And I was like, oh my God. And I got off the plane and I read my text messages and I looked at what there was to look at. And uh, I started sobbing. I mean, like hyperventilating and sobbing. And I think it was because I did not have that emotional reaction to the draft decision. Even though I took it at face value, I did not think it was a a figment. I didn't think it was, you know, red herring. Um, But I think there was that moment where it's like, you do believe something is going to intervene. Yeah. Right? Like something has be. to it change. Just it just be. can't. Right. And then all of a sudden, it's like nothing intervened. And it is what is coming is going to be so horrific. And we've started to see that. I'm from Texas. The stories are bad, bad out of Texas. But it was also that moment of like, they did this through their authoritarian will. And so the implications for women terrifying the implications for democracy, overwhelming. Yeah, I think that was certainly shared. There was an interesting moment wherein the 
immediate aftermath, there was the sense that the administration had to do something about it, that there was some magic thing that Biden could do that would fix this or minimize this. And when it became apparent that there was relatively little that the administration could do, there seemed to be a shift, which in my mind was really beautiful to watch, in which women and men said, okay, we're going to have to do this on our own. And you saw the movement to get measures on the ballots. You saw the momentum build um, for 2022 um, for the midterms. Did you feel that sense, too, that there was a sense not unlike, frankly, the 2016 election when you realized, oh, crap, no one is going to fix this other than us, where people got mad and they got engaged? Did you have that sense? I did. I think there was, it took a minute for the shock to wear off. (laughs) Yes, it absolutely did. Um, And it took a minute to realize that there was, and I was, I don't know about you, I'm sure you were exactly the same, but um, I was so frustrated by the incoming text messages and emails being like, what can we do? And I was like, where the hell were you? You know, (laughs) Um, but I think the answer, too, that was really important is it's not one thing that you can do. It's going to be everything and you're going to have to vote and you're going to have to campaign and you're going to have to, like, get signatures for a ballot measure and you're going to have to engage in direct service. You might have to drive someone somewhere far away. You might have to, you know, it was all the different things. And all of a sudden, it's not a pulling the lever in the ballot box that fixes it. It's the, oh, this is a daily discipline if we are going to mitigate harm for the years to come. But it was, I think to your point, it was just this very beautiful thing to watch once that took effect and and the creativity and the camaraderie that emerged and the new relationships and the vibrancy of, uh, you know, really a a ground up movement has been something to behold. And in... Covering this story, I have talked to so many abortion providers who have moved, you know, picked up stakes, moved over a state line, reestablished them, now are providing services to their former clients in a location where it's legal. And the staff, the doctors, the nurses who do this have just been courageous, have just been extraordinary in showing their patients that they care for them, that they will be there for them. I was in Wisconsin earlier this year, and I had a wonderful dinner with eight or nine OBGYNs. And one of them told me the story that really brought me to tears. She had a patient who was a high-risk pregnancy. And at one of the prenatal checkups, she actually grabbed the doctor's hand and she said, promise me that if there's a problem, you'll put me first. Just the fact that there was a doubt, that there was a worry, that her life would take second place because there was now this 1849 law that made no medical sense, that violated medical standards, it really made me cry. It was proof and it was vivid to me from the day one that this was putting women's lives at risk. Women who had had miscarriages, women who didn't even seek an abortion, women who needed those drugs for other medical purposes, Uh, women who needed an OBGYN. And by the way, OBGYNs are picking up stake and leaving, so it's really hard to get an OBGYN, even if you're not seeking an abortion. You could just see it coming, and then it did. And these horror stories, rape stories, the denial of care, the endangerment, it has been horrifying and heartbreaking. And I sometimes think that the people who voted for these bills didn't know or they didn't care what the results were going to be. It was like, what did you think was going to happen? What did you think was going to happen when women in distress need an abortion and Some doctor had to contemplate, well, is she sick enough? Could she die? Do we want to give her the abortion? Do we not want to give her abortion? What did they think that was going to happen? And 
you know, it's very interesting. On the state level, these bans have been flying off the presses. But it's really interesting, isn't it, to see the reaction at the national level of Republicans who suddenly, gosh, they don't want to talk about it so much. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that dynamic of whether these Republicans are also game to be pushing forward to worse and worse outcomes like a national abortion ban. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of politicians around the country are learning that they are not as well suited as they might have thought to practice medicine, especially when they don't even know the patients that they're practicing on. And we've seen examples of that in state legislatures. I will say there was a very famous case of a state legislator in South Carolina being like, I didn't know. How could this be? That's not what I thought was going to happen. And I think um, his testimony about that circulated virally. But what was less viral is that he voted the exact same way when it came down to it a month later. And I think that speaks to the fact that many of these people feel really like they have a choice to make, and that choice is maintaining good standing with an increasingly radical base that offers them a job, is an elected official, or sort of women's lives, and they're choosing themselves. Yes. And they're choosing their own stature. And that is as terrifying as anything, quite honestly. Um, I think that we are in for a reckoning. I think that um, most National Republicans know that there is no public appetite for a federal ban, and yet that is what the base is going to demand. And they've shown a ravenous appetite for primarying people out of existence who don't follow their orthodoxy. I think you've seen that. I mean, we saw that during the Kavanaugh fight, right, Jennifer? The sort of like Mitch McConnell, who is the standard bearer of the Republican Party, being like, nothing's going to happen to Roe v. Wade. What's wrong with you, a hysterical people, right? You would think that the standard bearer of the Republican Party, given where the Republican Party is, would be embracing now as our chin. Put Kavanaugh on the bench. He's going to be the vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. But they don't because they know they're both on the wrong side of history and, quite honestly, on the wrong side of the electorate, even in some place like Kentucky, which, by the way, I love the Kentucky example because they have elected a pro-choice governor. Um, But um, I think it is going to be fascinating to watch how that plays out electorally. But I will tell you, um, and I know you are are so much more optimistic than me, Jennifer. It's one of the reasons I love talking to you. I do think when they're in that sort of vice grip, which we have seen them in before, it just makes them become more committed to undermining democracy because they know they can't rely on democracy. And that's my fear. I want to gloat. I want to be like, well, they're going to have their comeuppance. And we certainly saw some of that in 2022. But their adjustment will be to further undermine democracy. And I think we better get prepared for that. You make a really good point. I'm not as optimistic as I was. Um, there you go. See, uh, Lisa, I love you because you think I'm the optimist of the, <laughs> the group. I'm rarely in that club. Um, it was interesting. Um, and I think this happened for several reasons, but clearly Dobbs was a motivating factor, that the election did not turn out the way the experts and the pundits thought it would in 2022. And I still think... A lot of the political establishment, a lot of the media doesn't get it. When they think average voter, they still think of a guy, some white dude, you know, in Nebraska someplace. And they do not realize first that women are a majority of the electorate and how emotionally galvanizing this issue was. And people who were saying, oh, it won't make a difference, it'll balance out. I said, you have no idea how angry people are. And we saw a couple of things. We saw, first of all, a lot of women register to vote during that summer, right after Dobbs, um, disproportionate to the number of men. And secondly, we saw um, what was going to be like this Republican red wave, you know, kind of circle the drain and go down because people actually got mad. And you look at the statistics now, I mean, 
I think your organizations have always had accurate polling showing the degree of support, but now it's off the charts. Even the mainstream, you know, pollsters and so on can't deny it. There is a super majority in favor of choice. You, you think America is divided? Well, on this, they're actually not. I mean, not 50-50. Yes, there's a hardcore, but there's an overwhelming sense that this is about freedom, that this is about women's health, that this is the, about women's right to control their own destiny. And I think the popular recognition of this um, is not going to go away. My sense is that this is going to continue to build until people see things change, that these bans go away, that we either have a constitutional rethinking or that there's a legislature in return in retreat. I don't see that the um, anger towards Dobbs has abated. Um, have you? No, I definitely don't think the anger has abated. And I certainly don't think that it will, because I think the harms will continue to grow in visibility the more that the longer we have abortion bans in place and the more states that adopt them. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see the anger grow. I think that um, there is, and that presents tremendous electoral opportunity. I mean, I certainly am the first one to counsel Democrats to go on offense yes, on this. Which and many did in 2022. Many did in 2022. And, and yeah, I'm totally with you. And I think that, um, you know, the more that people study those playbooks and understand that there is um, not only a, a principled and politically winning way to throw the first punch on standing strong for abortion rights. But in fact, it's imperative because once, you know, they come in with, as you said, their misinformation about, but you support, you know, abortion up till birth, then you're already back on your heels. I think it is important and will play well for us. I think that, um, we did see, and I, I only say this because I want to caution against it. I want your listeners to be vigilant for it. Um, we did see sort of a um, necessary coping mechanism during the Trump years where you just, there were so many terrible things happening on a daily basis that you had to become a little bit immune to it. Um, and you couldn't live with that level of fear and outrage on a daily basis and go about your business. And so, you know, I think that there is some question of like, will people adjust to a new normal and start to tune it out? And the answer is we can't. We can't afford to, right? And then the other thing that I do worry about um, is that the Republicans are really, really good at telling their future. And I think this goes to your point about how the pundits and the prognosticators got it so wrong in 2022. They were the ones pumping out stories about the red wave. Exactly. They were the ones. And, and because we still have a media establishment that is predominantly male, that is just sort of coming around to paying attention to the nuances of the abortion issue and the choice issue, um, they sort of bought what the Republicans were saying and they didn't question it. And they were just sort of implicitly blind to the building energy that you and I were talking about the whole time. And a couple of pollsters, by the way, who were getting it, but they were the outliers. Um, and so I do want to make sure that they don't get to do that again exactly. in 2024 exactly. and that we do hold the media more accountable to not just take their bait, but to actually do independent investigation. And one of the things that I have been uh, very cranky and outspoken about is the need for at least the Senate, because the House is hopeless, to have hearings in which the victims, and I do call them victims, um, who are traumatized, whose lives are endangered, um, the doctors who live under a threat of prosecution, where their stories are being told. And um, they consented to do one such hearing. I think they need to do more of them and they need to do them around the country. But I will say there was one election that gave me real hope, and that was the Supreme Court race in Wisconsin. That was a race for all the marbles, in a sense. That was front and center, this 19th century, practically total ban. You had the Supreme Court that was at stake, three conservative judges, three progressive judges, and the swing state, the swing seat was up for grabs. 
And in Wisconsin, where elections are determined by usually less than a point because it's such a divided state, the progressive judge who explicitly embraced uh, freedom of choice won by 11 points. That, to me, was a sign that if you can take, if you can make Wisconsin a 11-point state, then what we are potentially saying, potentially, is a transformation of our politics. And I hope that that continues to play out because not only is abortion at issue, but you're absolutely right. Equally important in that race was this hyper-gerrymandered district plan that essentially disenfranchised millions of voters in Wisconsin. So I think we should close on an up note because we don't want people to go away depressed because depression leads to introversion, leads to inaction, leads to letting the other side win. So give people several things that they could do if they want to promote the pro-choice cause that they could do that they don't have to be a politician. They don't have to be, you know, a senator. What could they do? Yeah. And I just want to acknowledge the optimism in the Wisconsin story, but also it was a perfect combination of optimism and commitment to organizing. Ben Wickler is a tremendous Democratic State Party chair. He came up in an organizing mentality. It wasn't just throw it on the ballot and see what happens. There were years and years of investing in turning out the base and messaging to the base. And I say that because I think it is the thing that people can do, right? These things don't just happen on the day that you drop your ballot off or you go to the voting booth. And so what you can do is commit to doing something. If it's once a week, that's what fits in your schedule. If it's once a month, volunteer for your state party, go to town halls, ask the hard questions of Republicans. But is that daily discipline of raising up our voices in support of abortion rights and the freedom that it represents and the democracy that hangs into the ballot We are the ones we are waiting for. We are the ones that will make a difference. And when we put our skin in the game and we commit a little bit over time, that's what brings it home on Election Day. Boy, is that right. And I will share one last story. When I was in Wisconsin, I went out to a organizing hub. And as you say, Ben Wickler has the entire state you know, completely blanketed. And there was a young woman who was running a particular office. It was... I don't know, 20 degrees out, the snow was piled up, the sidewalks were icy, and she was getting together these groups of people to go door knocking, to engage in face-to-face, uh, really, um, politics at its finest sense. And she was organizing them, and she had the app, and she was sending them out. And I went over to her, I said, like, who are you? What, what's your background in organizing? And she said, oh, I'm in my gap year between high school and college. I decided I would put off college because this was too important. Oh, wow. And that told me there is hope. If I just got can goosebumps. Do it, they can't it, see yes. me on camera, but I just got goosebumps. Uh, if a teenager can do that and commit her life and do it with such sense of purpose and such maturity, by gosh, um, many of us can do it and can do more of it. Um, so on that Elise, thank you for all of your years in the trenches, and thank you for coming on the show, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you for your voice, always, Jennifer, and thanks for having me on. Bye-bye. And that was Elise Hogue. You can see why we have bonded over the years. I think her mixture of skepticism and concern Uh, And undying faith in the American people is just the right attitude to take on this issue and so many other issues. If you become too depressed, if you withdraw, you let the other side win. And that is a catastrophe in this case for women, but really for our entire society. And I would like to think that people are understanding that democracy is at the center of all of these issues that you care about. You saw in the gun issue in Tennessee, they tried to shut down the students who were protesting by throwing out of the legislature 
two African-American representatives. You see right there, they can't win on the merits, so they try to deprive us of democracy. And so whether it's guns or whether it's abortion or climate or any other issue you care about, unless democracy is the cornerstone of our system, unless your voice can be heard, you're never going to prevail on those issues because those issues that you care about are actually popular. That's the mainstream. Don't let the Republicans tell you that you're in some kind of fringe or you're part of the elite and that real America thinks differently. That's just not the case, whether it's abortion or any other issue. So keep your voice and keep your spirits up. I hope you enjoyed this program as much as I did. If you did, tell your friends, ask them to follow us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever they get their podcasts. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.